Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us, joining the session. We're lucky one speaker. <laughs> we're, we, are, um, we have the wonderful Marie with the prototype fund here. And then uh, towards the end of it, we have the Solver Tech Fund in order to maintain a sustainable, sustained uh, digital infrastructure, and that's Tara. In the middle is the heart of <laughs> maintaining open source projects. <laughs> and uh, presenting lovely Rami with the Open Technology Fund. We're going to start with um, some high-level questions, but really want this time for you all to ask questions. And we're going to start with, uh, could you please all introduce yourself and describe your organization's mission? I can start. Is this, yeah, it's on. Hi, I'm Marie. I'm a co-director of Prototype Fund. Uh, we're a German fund from the um, Federal Ministry for Education and Research here. Uh, we can uh, fund projects in Germany that are all open source um, and come from civil society and are good for civil, civil society. We've got a pretty broad funding scope as long as it's somehow linked to innovation, um, no maintenance, and uh, is open source. Hi everyone, my name is Romy, pronoun he, him. I'm currently based in Berlin. I work for OTF, Open Technology Fund. And OTF is a nonprofit that supports different technologies around censorship and surveillance to empower users' security and safety. And uh, we have a broad mandate to support um, different technologies around applied research and tech development. Um, and OTF provides different support, including labs and funding. Thank you, Romy. Um, hello, I'm Tara. I'm a technologist at the Sovereign Tech Fund. We're also a German fund funded by the Ministry for uh, Economy and Climate, BMVK. Uh, and um, the goal of our fund is to fund uh, open source infrastructure, or what we call digital basis technologies. So essentially libraries, uh, developer tools, um, uh, operating systems, uh, things like that. So the things that, um, yeah, basically all other technologies run on and are dependent on them because we think like for us like it was funded uh, to support um, those particularly vulnerable technologies that uh, and the likes of like things that were affected by heartbleed and things like that um it's hard for me to say like it's from, often people ex try to ask us like how, uh, if a project fits under a mandate or not it's hard to explain but the best way i found it like and this is a very rough way of judging if more developers than users know your tool, then probably we're, we're, we would be a good fit. But again, that's just a very rough way of, just, of explaining it. Thank you so much. I think uh, some of your organizations have been around now for almost a decade, and they've seen its um, mechanism as a support for open source projects evolve over the years. Uh, could you please share some examples of key projects that you've recently supported? I can start again. Um, as I said, we have quite a broad funding scope. That means that we've also funded very different projects. Uh, one of the projects that you may know is uh, Mastodon. We funded uh, their Android app and some other bits. Um, we've also funded a lot of uh, more data-related projects like maps, uh, visualization of uh, results in, of votes in the EU Parliament, um, and more infrastructure projects like OpenMLS, which I guess we've all funded at this point. <laughs> Um, so, we like to think of the internet as, a, as an infrastructure of different layers, so OTF works on different elements of, of support. So, for example, some of the examples of projects we supported when it comes to infrastructure protocols, TLS, HTTPS, WireGuard, when it comes to different front-facing front apps and tools such as um, Signal, for example, is one good example, Tor project, and a bunch of operating systems such as Subgraph, for example. Um. So uh, we're we're quite a recent fund. We just we just got our funding last year. So uh, we only have a pilot round so far that's out. Uh, um, so yeah, we did fund OpenMLS, uh, which is a library for communications. We um, also fund we also funded uh, two uh, projects within the OpenPGP system. So OpenPGP.js and Sequoia PGP because we have a strong focus on interoperability and, and supporting a protocols ecosystem. Um, we support also internet like base layer protocols like Open BGPD, um, and finally, I know you're not allowed to have favorites as a funder, but uh, 
I'm really excited that we got the opportunity to also support Fortran, uh, which is a, a, a rather, it's, it's, it's a program language that's been around for a while, but it's, it's very important for things like mo mo for the scientific community, particularly mo climate models, for example, I th and we're so happy to be able to sort of uh, support sort of like its uh, modernization renewal by, uh, yeah, helping them work on their uh, uh, package manager. Yeah, thanks everyone. Uh, so who in the audience is currently working on an open source project? Can you please raise your hand? And uh, you keep your hands raising if you face challenges to maintaining and sustaining these projects. Thank you. I, so the next question to the panel is, uh, what are some of the biggest challenges you see in maintaining open source projects? And um, how does your organization address these challenges? Um. I don't need to start every time, so feel free. <laughs> um, so one of the problems that we have is that we um, can uh, we can exclusively fund uh, or almost exclusively fund code, and uh, that's always a big problem when you want to do an open source project because uh, there is a lot of other things that come into play when you want to build an a new open source project, you need to think about uh, user testing, you need to think about design, you need to think about uh, community building, about uh, financing your project after the fund, all that stuff. Um, so one of the things we try to do is to provide coaching. So we even have some of our coaches in the room today. Um, and uh, we try to like help them as much as we can. But if you'd like be to improve funds, like thinking about that for us would be like a big, big improvement. Um, what we do right now is just small bits, I'd say. Um, thank you. Um, I think there are a bunch of challenges that we see depending on where does the app or tool sit in the infrastructure. So if it's a programming language, if it's a script, if it's a front-end or back-end library. But generally speaking, some common pain points across different FOSS projects is usability. Uh, we realize how much usability has a negative effect if it's not being planned in, in ahead in advance very quickly, after two or three years, they hit different uh, uh, um, dead ends uh, with the um, adoption rate, uh, security problems, usability problems, and so on. And many of the first projects, out of goodwill, they think so much around the engineering aspect, or the, around the architecture aspect, for good reasons. And then they think of usability as an afterthought process, or like maybe a, at a future time. On one hand, many of the FOSS teams, they don't compromise the entire expertise. So like maybe any FOSS team has at any given point, let's say 15 skills or like 20 skills. So like there are some aspects that wouldn't come naturally to their mind around, for example, sustainability or usability. That's one aspect. And the other thing is uh, the feedback loop between users and the app maker. Um, there is an enormous amount of gap that many people are trying to fill recently between the users at risk and developers who are, who are actually developing um, the app and code. Uh, many people, including people on this panel, are trying to create different feedback loops between software makers and, and, and users. Uh, this, I think, will eliminate lots of pain points in the FOSS lifecycle project and will also ensure some better adoption rate. Um, I would say that the funding itself is the is, is a big challenge. I think, like for many projects, um, that the current funding landscape, like either there's like uh, lots of funding for like for one particular area, depending on like sort of what hype there is. Also, like funding cycles are like very short. Like usually, particularly public funding, like it's usually one year funding or or less. Um, and also, like there's a huge burden on maintainers. So, if specifically if, when we work with uh, smaller projects, like small to medium open source projects that do not have, for example, their own like accounting team or things like that, process, uh, things like reporting and invoicing becomes an issue as well. Um, unfortunately, those are not like these are things that we're trying to work on right now. Uh, but obviously, like being a public funder, like we still have to work sort of like within the the frames of the law and sort of what currently exists. But there is obviously like room for improvement and also room to advocate to our funders that, hey, those things maybe need to change if you want, really want to support a sustainable, equitable eco -source system, uh, open source ecosystem. Yeah, thanks, Tara. I think for this is a segue into my next question. Are there, what are some of the gaps in where resources are steered uh, within this ecosystem? And what role do you think funders and maybe other stakeholders like governments or uh, businesses could play to fill these gaps? Uh, I could start this time. <laughs> um, um, one, one thing I see is that there's obviously like um, funding is great. It helps pay people's bills and things. Uh, people like money and, uh, to a certain point, but uh, as long as they can like survive. Uh, particularly like, uh, but I think like one of the problems is that what, what the one thing money can't do is write code. So 
um, and there's a very uh, very obvious sort of need for uh, more developers. Like there's a, there's lots of projects that are struggling to find contributors. There's lots of maintainers that would like to be able to like pass on the mantle at some point, but they feel pressure to like continuing on maintaining the software because uh, yeah, there's enough contributions. So uh, I think like what we need now, what we urgently read right now is pushing more people to um, like either like education programs, just more onboarding of uh, new de new developers. And I think one of the problems in that is that again, there's uh, there's obviously like we live in a constant sort of like hype machines. Like I think. Um, what, like for example, like most recently, it's been blockchain and then artificial intelligence, and those things create more pressure on infrastructure projects, but they do not contribute back to those projects. So just creating usage of those uh, like critical packages, but without equally sort of contributing um, critical maintenance and upgrades and things to sustain those communities. So yeah, that's a challenge that I see. Um, thank you. Um... I think there are enough resources in the space for the FOSS community from ideation to first release, but there is very rare resources around sustainability of the current code base. Uh, most funders focus on new features, new things, new skills, new architecture. Everything has to be new and shiny and sexy, but like nothing focuses on the current code base. And the future of the internet and the future of any apps and tools around privacy and security relies on the maintenance of the current code base. We cannot embark on new anything new without maintaining what we have at the moment. Uh, and the problem is that we see lots of developers spending so much time to convince the funders with basically a sustainability roadmap to convince them that this, that this is important. Uh, I think having a, a cultural mind shift within the funders' space is very important to understand that sustainability is security and privacy, and sustainability is a crucial part for the future of the internet. So the idea that you only fund new things isn't true, and you cannot fund new things without maintaining current things. Hi, with the funder for new things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so for us, it's it's just the deal with the ministry. We can only fund innovation, and we can try to reframe innovation as broadly as we can, which we do. But that's the limit of the fund. Um, and I feel like there is a lot of efforts right now into doing more infrastructure, like with your funds, for example. But uh, part of our projects will never be funded by your funds because we don't only do infrastructure. We do do a lot of shiny apps, uh, data related stuff, and there the maintenance is an absolute nightmare, like all these projects with scrapers or community generated content, they never find any funding. Um, and we've like been trying to find other ways to help them. Um, there are models without money, which is not optimal. There are success stories like Nextcloud taking over um, the salaries of uh, the maintainers of a community app and giving them jobs so they can can keep maintaining their tool, um, but they're like single stories and uh, we see a big lack in funding projects that have been started and that's something that also on the side of our funders, like the people from us, have not has not been really seen and react reacted upon until now. Yeah, thank you all for sharing. I do have other questions, but I want to open up to the audience to... Um... Oh, yeah. Okay, it would be great if you were talking to the mic. Because we're recording this. Cool. Uh, I assume this works. Uh, very interesting insights. Um, one question I have for you that I know I've been thinking about a lot recently is about like the resiliency of fundings. You know, especially um, coming from an American institution where many large tech companies, which were used to be a huge source of funding for open source, um, now with layoffs and funding cuts, uh, we're seeing many communities sort of relying on the source of funding and then realizing that maybe in the next year it's just going to go poof. Um, I'm, I'm curious if you can speak about like sort of from your perspective as funders or as people working within organizations that fund these things, kind of how you think about this issue of resiliency and how long term your funding plans can be and, you know, that dependency that comes on you? you know, I know it's a general question, but I'm curious if there's been any discussions on your side of things about this with anything that's going on. Yeah, I mean, that's an important point. Like, I, like the easy answer is I think like everyone should have diverse models of funding, but we all know how unrealistic that is uh, in the current sort of funding landscape. 
I think for us personally, as a sort of a sovereign tech fund, we're, we're trying to be a model. We don't want to become, we want to support infrastructure. We don't want to become infrastructure ourselves. Like we don't want to be reach a point where we're this sort of critical thing that just needs to live alone so that other projects can live. Um, we want to prove that public funding for infrastructure works and we want to show people how to do it by doing this openly and transparently and also encouraging like for us, like currently, like we're funding on the state level, but I think there's also opportunities, for example, within Europe to have more funding for infrastructure on the EU level, also within Germany, for example, on the federal sort of like and state levels, like just there's many ways where funding can flow towards those projects. And I think part of our long term strategy is proving that and engaging with those other people and making sure that there's more sources of public funding. Again, also, we want to encourage um, uh, companies to continue to contribute to open source like I know currently it's a, it's a difficult situation but hopefully this is just temporary and that uh, we go back to because I think like there's been increased recognition the past couple of years of how important this contribution this this private contribution is to the ecosystem and uh, while it's sad to see what's happening right now I think hopefully like we, we haven't like we will continue sort of pushing that point and making sure that companies recognize that, that importance. And yeah, I mean, um, ultimately, like, fun, like, we keep asking projects, how will you be sustainable? But I think we're at a point now where projects are asking funders, how are you going to sustain this? And I think we need to come up with answers from our end. I think STF is already a success story because technically uh, it was kind of spawning out of prototype fund, which is a ridiculously small fund and people who had experiences there then built STF, which is a much larger and more sustainable fund. Um, I think trying to be advocates for building funds in different parts of society is like really important. I really like, for example, talking to um, journalism institution, um, like for example, uh, state radio and TV structures in Germany are very strong and there are people there trying to do open source, maintain open source tools on the payroll of the media, which is also state funded. Um, those models are really interesting and I think we have to do a lot of outreach. Thank you. Um, my mind is spinning between different points. I want to start with building on Torah and Marie. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it's an important question. And it's, I think it's part of our responsibility and the collective responsibility to like, come up with mechanisms. OTF, for example, has recently started a new for sustainability funding mechanism um, to address the sustainability of apps and tools. Historically, OTF even couldn't invest money in the sustainability of its own apps and tools that it supported over the past nine to 10 years. Uh, and, and, and nowadays, as we are expanding with our funding and our growth, we are addressing new and emerging problems that, that we would like to address. And because we think sustainability is a global problem, we shouldn't be solving it by ourselves. So we are trying to commit with, with different groups to join these forces. So for example, we speak a lot with uh, uh, big companies to commit towards open source, like, uh, like Tara was saying. Uh, and you are seeing some cultural shift towards many big companies in the space um, who rely a lot on open source dependencies that committing towards this, not only committing money, but also committing people. We need developers from different spaces to join that. Uh, because like generally speaking, there is no enough equity between the skills between the nonprofit developer landscape and, uh, and the corporate landscape. So like if you look into, um, <laughs> the software health of password managers, VPNs, apps and tools that are being developed by, by techies for users at risk, they are not well maintained in comparison to other apps and tools developed for, for similar purposes, but like in other contexts. Um, so like on one hand, I think it's, it's OTF is committed to like incremental support with different projects over their software life cycle. And I think OTF really understands the cycle of different FOSS projects. So like that's why we are committed to supporting them at different elements of their growth, not only an incremental support and then like we just vanish again. That's great. Are there any other questions? Thanks. I guess my question is kind of similar to the previous one because I also keep thinking about all these huge companies that profit uh, from the open source packages and libraries that are out there and they like to use them and they make huge heaps of money from it and they don't contribute back and that's great for them but uh, sometimes I get into my fields and I think it's super unfair and then I think about how we can actually push them or what kind of campaign we would need to actually make them contribute. I mean you have already, all three of you have already spoken on the need and the necessity um, that they should contribute not only money, but also people and time and contributions. Um, but when I'm very deep in my fields, I'm almost uh, on one extreme of the spectrum. I'm like, we need some kind of open source tax, we tax, 
uh, yeah, tax. Uh, we have to force them to give something back because they only take and make money from it. And they're like, okay, that's probably not feasible. That's not going to work. And um, but do we need to nudge them or push them to incorporate some kind of open source contribution into their CSR campaigns or some? I don't know, some campaign that they all commit under an, um, uh, under an umbrella term and they say, yeah, we are going to commit something, we are going to contribute. Like, what concrete ideas maybe do you have to, to push them and to nudge them? Thanks. Well, uh, I'm, I'm, people know me will find this weird, but I think like, I would rather, like, for me, like, approach, like, instead of like, a more forcing approach for companies, I think like a more... Um, yeah, like, uh, what's, what's the term, like, leading them with honey sort of approach is, is better, because I think it also affects the quality of the contributions. Like, forced contributions will be, like, are terrible, like, and won't be, again, also, like, companies, I think, like, also, it's important to remember that the people working in those companies themselves are people too, and some of them are huge, like, open source supporters and might believe in open source more as a philosophy, and also, like, same... And I feel like that's um, that's the kind of contributions we would like to sort of I think encourage. And while it does suck that like everyone can benefit from open source and not contribute, um, um, we, it's also important to remember that like not all contributions are equal. And also, um, uh, and also that when countries contribute, in typical like in, in, a, in a more traditional sense, like when companies contribute to open source projects, they usually only contribute in their own interest. And there's a wider public interest that necessitates public funding. So I think like there's multiple approaches needed. Like a cultivating, um, incur like there's a job for like open source evangelists working with companies, encouraging the philosophy of open source and how it brings benefit to all. There's also a job for taxes, funding public funds that go into open source projects and might represent an interest, like a public interest that's not existing, uh, that companies might not be the best suited to support. Uh, and yeah, it's just a variety of approaches, but the one approach I wouldn't recommend is having like some sort of restrictive license or sort of some sort of law saying that companies have to contribute to open source because I, I don't think that works, to be honest. Um, yeah, um, Tara mentioned most of the things I, I wanted to, to highlight, um, but also like building on that, it's important, in my point of view, like we are not enemies, we are complementary in different ways because like even big companies, they use and produce open source code, even, even if it's not promotely outside there, but like it's outside there. Uh, and there are different elements that will always require us and them to, to help each other. Like one, one good example is OpenVPN and WireGuard. OpenVPN, for example, is one of the most amazing FOSS projects because it sits on two major efforts, the company and the community. So there's the OpenVPN company who, who maintains the benefits and the roadmap of the, of the corporate universe, and then the community. And, and, and there's a huge community maintaining the roadmap of the community benefits. Both are important, but like I cannot change the corporate's roadmap or the community roadmap, but we need as coders and maintainers to respect both and merge both equally important. So like the idea is how can we merge with equal access the, the, the roadmap of coming from the corporate side and from the community side. Um, and at the end, there are different contributions that now there is no much mandate to force corporates to open source their, uh, their code base. But like in my experience, many companies listen to the community. So like if you look only to over the past four or five years, many big companies like Microsoft, Apple, um, Dell, HP, and so on, they are releasing their code bases open in different ways and committing to the open source camp. So like there's a gradual shift happening in the space. Uh, and now, like with even governments like France and Germany and Netherlands, they're also mandating their own cities to uh, uh, align with open source infrastructure, open source code, which means more money coming to the space, more maintenance cycle, and so on. I think forcing will work. Look at H&M. Um, we've been putting pressure on that kind of companies to be more green. And what we have is greenwashing. And if we do the same with open source, we're going to have open source washing or whatever it's called. Um, and we'd rather have few companies doing a good job at supporting open source with people who really believe in it and help them instead of being totally lost and not knowing who to support uh, because we don't have much cap capacities. I think uh, the people are very interesting. Um, most companies have uh, real open source fans working in the company and they don't do open source, but the people do open source stuff. Maybe in the evening they maintain the next cloud or help OpenStreetMap or whatever and um, supporting those people to bring uh, the next step into open source in their company is always uh, really rewarding. And I think that's a good approach. Yeah, it's your classic tragedy to comments. So if we don't figure it out, like we shouldn't beat ourselves hard. Like it's, it's a hard problem to solve. 
you so much. There's um, an online question. What do you think about adding 1% hashtag open source tax to proprietary software sales, similar to value added tax, uh, like the VAT, to generate constant revenue for the OS ecosystem relative to the size of the software industry? I love the idea, but we can't do that. Uh, like From my point, I don't think it's my role to enforce things. My role is to like advocate for things in a different way and create opportunities for like everyone alike. Um, there is not enough momentum at any given country or any given political ecosystem to like come up with enforcing open source and enforcing tax payments around open source. Um, and there's lots of unjust issues happening in many countries like to begin with before reaching this kind of, of conversation. Uh, but I think politicians and governments and parliaments in different countries have an opportunity to like advocate for change and like promote op open source as a crucial path for social justice and to enforce different companies to adopt open source principles. This will be a good starting point and maybe eventually companies will, will automatically commit back money or code towards open source rather than just, rather than just forcing them. Yeah, any tax needs to be decided by politicians and look at public money, public code, where we're at, how long we've been fighting for it. Uh, it's just not going to happen. Taking my, taking my SDF hat off for a sec. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's necessarily like a tax problem. Like, I think the money exists like to support open source ecosystems and it should just be a priority. Um, 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 but I think also... Like there, I might see like a tiny argument where it's more about sort of it's sort of like a tobacco tax where like we're trying to make people less reliant on proprietary software. But then again, as said, like I think that's a question for politicians if that's seen as, an, as a priority or something that's useful for society. I don't know. Thanks all. Oh, another question. Hey, great panel. Um, so my question is, if you had that magic wand, um, let's say for the next uh, four years, okay, um, in uh, you know, from a perspective of the projects or the demographics or the perspective of the, the organizations that fund, you know, what, what would you really want to see, would like to see happening, like some, some significant change so that uh, projects get the fund that they need, but also the funds to get the price that they need. From OTF's point of view, we are, like generally speaking, like we are very sensitive about telling people what to do and what not to do and what do we want, because like technically we don't want anything in particular. We want what the community wants. Um, so like OTF is highly driven by the community's roadmap and the community's problems and community's need. So what I would like to see is that the pain points that, are, that the people are suffering from now are resolved in four years by different solutions. This could be money or services that OTF could be providing. So my goal is to support your roadmap to, to achieve what you want to achieve in four years, which will take your project to a better health, I think. So like, what, what do you need from us is, is, is should be the question for OTF to answer, rather than what do we want to see, because like OTF will not remain forever outside there, and there shouldn't be any single point of failure for anyone on OTF or any of the current funders. Um, so as, as, as the other way, how can you best use OTF to your benefit until like we last? I feel like there was so many answers possible to that question. What would I change? Uh, you said demographics. Um, I'd like to not fund five robots, seven Linos, and three Lucas in each round, um, and have like a bit more diverse teams applying. But that also depends on education and how many people actually uh, do open source that are not white German dudes here, and our funding scope, of course, because we can only fund in Germany. Um, I'd also, and that's. I take off my prototype on that now. Uh, personally, I'd like to do some more uh, long-lasting infrastructure and a bit less shiny apps, um, but that depends on where our funding comes from. Uh, I, there is not one thing I'll change. I, if I'd had the magic wand, I'd change a lot. Yeah, I was, I was, for the past five seconds, I've been stewing my own system, system, saying there's no easy solutions, there's no magic wand, this is, um, there's no solutions worth solving that are... Easy, but yeah, I do agree that like 
being able to promise projects more than like one year of funding is something I would really like to change like with a wand because I think it makes a huge difference when someone is like fighting for their like funding year after year whereas like they have like more five years to like plan and do things and have that security so um, yeah that's for me like would be the most fundamental thing like I would like to see uh, that I would have I think would have substantial benefits for projects. I think I think if I have if I have a magic wand, I would love to see, like in the next two years, ten OTFs on the planet, not just one OTF. We need like many OTFs from many countries and many commitments towards that OTF. Yeah, I love OTF. I love our work, but we're only one space. I would love to see ten OTFs from different countries, private and government money, uh, pushing into this. So like now we have prototype fund, sovereign fund, and OTF. That's amazing. But like hopefully three years from now, there are twenty people on this planet, not just three of us. I have to say there are two prototype funds now. <laughs> the Swiss have one too. Hardware funding, yeah. Um, the, coming back to the tax question, I don't think um, putting another tax um, is going to make anyone happy. But um, maybe uh, the government could could um, give tax uh, what you call it, refunds or something like the the work uh, for like contributing to open source should be uh, taxed like a donation. So you have a tax benefit to attract to make it financially attractive for companies to um, to sponsor open source. I think that would be not so difficult to get political. Uh, uh, backing for the idea? I think there are so many good ideas that would need political backing and the question is do you have the capacities to campaign? Like we're technically funders, uh, that's what we specialize in, we're not doing policy work um, or we try to do a bit by being funders but um, we have for example a prototype fund, it's five people, um, not all of which are full-time. We try to support the projects we have, we need net politics organization or something to campaign for this. Uh, we can give ideas, we can be on panels, we can discuss with people, but I don't see how we can also push for a new law to come into place, even if it's a very good one. Agree, uh, but, and also like one concrete example, I think here in Germany, for example, like if you ever try to run like a open source project and try to like set up something like a gege and Biha, which is like a, the closest thing Germany has for like non-profit status, you understand like how difficult it is like working with the tax office on like getting that status and all of that. So, I mean, that sounds to me like maybe something that that's an easy policy fix, but again, out of our scope. Um, I think when it comes to the jurisdiction support for any false code, it's, it's, it's international in different ways that we cannot attribute one particular code or project to one particular government or area. Um, so it's very hard to just have one particular country or government supporting something in addition from the rest of the community. Uh, because like for example, if you look into name any code, TLS, HTTPS, any infrastructure code, it has been developed cross-cutting lots of jurisdictions and lots of people from many, many, many backgrounds committing to this. Um, which means people in countries where there are more established democracies who can talk to the people of parliament to adopt false values, that could be one part of that. So even if you don't do policy and research and advocacy, but people who are in Europe, for example, or in Germany or in France, you have much more political power to influence your people in the parliament to adopt false values and to like, push for that. And this, and this could be a good starting point. Maybe some good news, like Munich has just announced an open source sabbatical. So if you work for the city of Munich, you can now take a sabbatical to work on open source. That's the kind of small fixes that can also be helpful because it's quite a lot of hours going into open source if people take it. Any other questions? Uh, thank you, uh, my name is Poen and I I'm still kind of new to all this, so sorry if the question doesn't <laughs> cover all the, or have all the background knowledge, but I was curious sort of your, around the minimum requirements you have for funding um, in terms of the stability or the longevity of projects, maybe the governance that's already set up within the community and how, um, like if that precludes you from funding certain types of projects that you would like to, and whether as a funder you see those requirements sort of shaping or pressuring projects to operate in a certain way that maybe I think you were very careful to say you're trying to take community direction. But I can also imagine if you say you need to have a legal structure in order for us to give us money, then that forces projects into an area where they might not originally have wanted to go to. 
I think that really, really depends on the fund. Um, so we prototype fund our prototype fund, so we have pretty much no constraints. You just have to do the hours and you can fail and it doesn't matter. We're not pushing to change your scope. Um, for us, that comes with a lot of projects failing. Uh, it's a wild bet taken on the project, on projects by the government, which can be a good thing. It's also a bit frustrating sometimes. Um, I think for us, the only thing is that um, government payments come really slow, so it excludes people who don't have a lot of money, so mostly people from minorities. Um, but except for that, like content-wise, um, at Prototype Fund, it's really free. Maybe even too much, some people would say. Yeah, thank you for the question. I, I love this kind of practical questions. Uh, so, um, OTF, is, we sit in a place with, with much more flexibility on funding, more than a classical donor, because we don't think of ourselves as a donor. Uh, we are incubated more than like a donor, so like we don't do donor grants, which gives us so much flexibility. So, we don't have minimum requirement. We don't have maximum requirement. Uh, we like to work with incremental support over double of years, so that we can submit a project for two years, two years, two years, and it keeps going. Uh, and the roadmap will dictate its future, basically. So it, 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 it all comes down to what, to what extent do you have a clear roadmap for us to understand and to support you with. So like this, this roadmap will, will take you through ideation, first release, beta, security audit, usability audit, roadmap, usability audit, and, and, and you keep going and so on. Um, and as long as like, it's, it's, it's growing well for you and for your community, we continue to support that. Uh, we have a broad remit, so like, if we reject something, it's because we, we, we don't see its value for the community, but like, we don't have any particular, we can also fund, it doesn't matter if you're an individual, a company, or a corporate, or a university, or an individual, or a bakery, it doesn't matter who you are, if you're doing open source for good, and you want to build something for that, we can work with you as, as an individual, as a newspaper, as an organization, and because OTF works with many people at risk, for example, in Egypt, in Bahrain, and many other situations, the NGOs laws are horrible for, for many communities out there. So like, people cannot freely organize and come up with hackerspace or a collective in Johannesburg or in like, Brazil, for example, or in Colombia. So people have to operate and organize in a, in a pretty rough environment laws. So like, OTF's responsibility is to like, elevate any pain points and to accommodate to people in different situations so like, we can work with you. No matter your country, if you come from Ukraine or you come from Brazil, we can work with you and like, we understand where you come from. So I think OTF has, has so much flexibility around that. Uh, for the Southern Tech Fund, currently like, all our funding is, is from the German government. Um, so we're bound by those laws. Um, but our general approach is we, we generally like, either scout for technologies that we think are interesting and would be a potential for funding or receive applications that let us know about those technologies. And once we've identified like an interesting area or a technology that's under maintained or might need uh, support in, in the public interest, we sort of try to understand sort of like what, what sort of like the particular case of that technology, how is it being maintained, who's maintaining it, what sort of legal form they have, and once we figure that out, we try to pick up the best uh, tool, like procurement tool that we have from what's available to us in, in German procurement law and, and use that to support that technology. So there's, yeah, we, uh, I think like, yeah, it does happen like on a case by case basis and we try to best to sort of serve the best interests of the maintainers of that technology. Okay, I've, I've got one uh, last online question. Uh, a, pr a practical question, it seems to me, um, and it goes like this. My team is developing open source products and technologies advancing privacy and digital security. We've been thinking recently about small, which is smaller than 10,000 US dollars, self-contained development projects that might be suitable for seed grants and which align with other existing goals and could be very useful to the open source community. Are there any seed funding opportunities like this? Uh, I can go first. So um, currently not from us. Um, the, the currently we fund things based on, a, like you need to know what you're already doing in order for us to fund it. That's number one. Number two, we're also currently a small team. So we're not able to process like the volume application that comes with smaller amounts of funding. So that's not gonna, always going to be the case. Hopefully, as we're currently also like looking for people to hire. So as we grow our team and have more capacity, maybe in the future, something like that will open up where we uh, support smaller uh, amounts of or smaller projects. Um, we don't provide grants. Um, that's That was the other thing that 
we provide uh, funding for projects or like we commission projects in this way. Um, thank you. Um, from OTF side, we have many doors to support small size or big size projects. It doesn't matter if it's small or big from your point of view. Um, so like look into OTF's options if you are still seeing me online. Check OpenTech Fund. Uh, there is a public guidebook for applicants um, to understand different things around funding process, cycle, timeline, expectations, lots of questions. So it's a good, like it's a small wiki that explains different things about our funding mechanisms. So go through it. If you have any questions, reach out to me. Um, and yeah. So same, we have a website, prototypefund.de. Uh, you need to be in Germany. Um, we fund with up to 50,000. That would be a full-time person six months. If you have less hours, you can be around 10,000 euros. I think less is not really worth the paperwork, mostly for both sides. The Sovereign Tech Fund also have an online presence? We do have sovereigntechfund.de uh, or .de. Um, yeah, we don't have our online application up yet, but it might be in a couple of weeks, who knows? Um, so yeah, keep an eye out for it. Uh, we do also have a newsletter if you want to be subscribed. We'll obviously announce there once once our online application will be up. Uh, and yeah, also I'm here for the rest of the day, so feel free to talk to me if you have any interesting ideas about projects to fund. Yeah, thank you all so much. Yeah, thanks a lot for uh, your insightful panel discussion.